While she was stubborn and gave the council fits with her attitude, Luxa was smart, strong, and unquestionably brave. A mutual appreciation had blossomed between the young queen and her subjects. This all contributed to Luxa's happiness, but Gregor knew the real source of her joy was Hazard, her six-year-old Halflander cousin with his lime green eyes and black curls who had been discovered living in the jungle. When his father, Hamnet, had been killed by an army of ants, Hazard had been orphaned. Luxa had brought him back to Regalia, and true to her word, it was as if they were now brother and sister. He lived with her in the royal chambers, ate with her, followed her like a puppy, and Luxa had allowed herself to love him. Gregor spotted Hazard flipping off a bat high over his head. Hazard was older than most of the kids, but riding on bats was still a new skill for him. While the boy was allowed to participate in flying exercises, Luxa had strictly forbidden anyone to train him in weapons. His father's dying wish had been for Hazard to be anything but a warrior, and Luxa had promised to fulfill it. While the other kids his age studied combat training, Hazard was developing his already extraordinary talent with languages. Ordinarily, the regalians made no effort to learn other creatures' tongues or language. But Hazard had been raised in the jungle where he tried to speak to anything that would speak to him. He'd come to regalia with a fluency in lizard and an ability to get by in several other animal languages. Vicus, who was Hazard's grandfather, as well as Luxa's, had arranged for a group of tutors. Showing far more patience with the quick, willing Hazard than he ever displayed with Gregor, Rip Red was teaching him to squeak and rat. Temp, the cockroach, who had rescued Boots from several disasters, taught both Hazard and the princess the clicking dialect of the crawlers. And Pervox, a beautiful red spider, had been shipped in to tutor him in her strange, vibrating means of communication. In his spare time, Hazard would try to talk with the bats, although some of their sounds were simply too high-pitched for human ears. As he walked toward his friends, a voice behind Gregor purred, jump. He took one step and leaped as high as he could in the air, stretching his legs out to the sides. The next second... He was riding on Eris's back. Gregor always felt a sense of security with Eris. They were Bonds, a human bat team who had taken an oath to defend each other to the death. And after facing a string of impossible difficulties together, they were real friends, too. How's it going, man? Gregor asked. Well, it goes well, said Eris. Gregor ran his hand over Eris's neck. A brand new layer of glossy black fur was beginning to conceal the purple plague scars. Gregor's bat, who had been the first victim of the plague, had not only managed to survive it, but had also made an extraordinary recovery. Within a few weeks of receiving the cure, he'd been begging the doctors to discharge him from the hospital. Afraid that he would fly back to his remote cave outside of Regalia before he had fully healed, the doctors released him into Luxa's custody. So now he lived with her and Hazard and Aurora in the royal wing of the palace. Gregor thought Eris probably preferred being with his friends to living in that lonely cave anyway. How soon do we eat? said Gregor as his stomach rumbled. Merith whistled, bringing the bats and their small charges down to the field. It must be now for the training ends, said Eris. Ten minutes later they were seated around a big table loaded with food. Besides Gregor, Luxa, Howard, nope, besides Gregor, Luxa, Hazard, Boots, Eris, and Aurora, there was a young bat that Hazard had taken a shine to, Thalia. She was a soft peach color with white streaks like a tabby cat, only about half grown, and had a love of jokes that Gregor found unsettling. He had modified some overland jokes for her. Why did the bat cross the river? To get to the other side. Something like that could make her laugh for, no kidding, ten minutes. Today, he told the old standby, Why is six afraid of seven? 
because seven, eight, nine. Unfortunately, she'd had a mouthful of food when the punchline came and nearly choked to death as she cracked up. Do you think she'll out she'll grow out of that? Gregor whispered to Luxa. I hope so. Hazard has his heart set on bonding with her. Luck she whispered back. Gregor ate a hearty meal of grilled fish, marinated mushrooms, and fresh bread. He contributed little to the conversation, though, because he kept wondering about Ripret and the Bane. After dinner, when the others went back to Lux's apartment to play games, Gregor said he had to make a trip to the museum. He really just wanted some time to think. Despite Ripred's warning, Gregor's impulse was to track down Vickis and tell him everything. But it was true that Vickis might go to the council, and most of the council members were jerks. If only he could find out what was in the prophecy Gregor or Ripred had mentioned. Nerissa. Gregor spun on his heel, heading away from the museum into the stone room that housed Sandwich's prophecies. Nerissa spent much of her time there. If anyone could tell Gregor what awaited him, it was that girl. She was part of the royal family, Luxa's cousin, and had even worn the crown for the few months when everyone thought Luxa had been killed by the rats. But unlike her resilient cousin, Nerissa was thin to the point of emaciation, psychologically frail, and had the ability to see glimpses of, the, uh, glimpses of the future, sometimes. She was no more able to control her visions than Gregor was to manage his powers to fight as a rager. She often had no idea if an incident she saw was about to occur in an hour or had happened a century before. Still, when she was right, she was dead right. As he had hoped, Gregor found Nerissa sitting alone in the prophecy room. Her physical state had deteriorated back to her pre-queen days. Long, tangled hair fell to her waist, and she was huddled in layers of mismatched clothing. Greetings, Overlander, she said with her ghostly smile. Hey, Nerissa, he said, and decided to get right to the point. Look, I was wondering about the prophecies about me. Are there any more of them? Yes, said Nerissa, one in particular. Am I supposed to kill the Bane again? asked Gregor. She looked at him quizzically. It is unclear. Possibly he will die, said Nerissa. Why are you asking this, Gregor? He didn't answer because that would mean exposing Ripred. Someone has been putting ideas in your head about the Bane again. But you may tell this someone that, that the prophecy of which you speak lies in the future, not our present time. How do you know, said Gregor? Because events reported in it have not yet come to pass. It is possible they never will, as I suspect this someone well knows. Perhaps he believes he can control fate, but he cannot, said Nerissa. She knows it's Ripred, thought Gregor. Will you show the prophecy to me? He asked out loud. No, it can be of no use to you now. In truth, I imagine it would be quite damaging. For your own safety and that of those you love, I believe you should avoid knowledge of it at all costs. Of course, if you would like to ask Vickis about it, there is nothing I can do to stop you, said Nerissa. After a warning like that, what could he say? Besides, Gregor had already ruled out asking Vickis, so he just shrugged like it didn't matter. No, if you think it would just throw me, never mind. On the one hand, he was relieved by, by the idea that at least temporarily he didn't have to deal with the issue of killing the Bane. From what Nerissa had said, it might never come up. On the other hand, Gregor realized that Nerissa's opinion would do little to sway Ripred. The rat, like many others, exp expressed a low opinion of her prophetic abilities. Although he had racked his brain, Gregor found himself without much of a solution when his lesson time rolled around the next day. As he unbarred the stone door, he tried to review his plan. He would meet Ripred and try to talk the rat out of killing the Bane. Gregor had little confidence in his ability to do this, though, so as a backup, he went ahead and hung a sword at his belt in case he had to protect the white rat's life. The idea of taking on Ripred was ludicrous, but, Gre but maybe Gregor could distract him long enough for the Bane to escape. Knowing that if they fought, Ripred Rip would try to take out his light immediately, Gregor had duct-taped a flashlight to his forearm. 
Instead of a, tor a torch, which would require a hand to hold, he had chosen a large glass oil lamp similar to the ones they had carried in the jungle. He could set it on the floor if need be. He mentally braced himself as he neared the circular cave, trying to sort out, out his argument for keeping the bane alive. But when Gregor reached the meeting place, it was empty. No ripred, no bane, no one at all. He waited 10, maybe 15 minutes. It was not like Ripret to be late. If anything, he had a way of popping up before you expected him. Just when Gregor was about to head back to Regalia, he heard a faint scratching noise in the tunnel the Bane had come from the day before. Ripred? He called softly. There was no answer. Pearl Pelt? The faint scratching came again. Is somebody there? Gregor set down the oil lamp and adjusted the flashlight on his arm. As he crept down a long tunnel toward the sound, he had the feeling it was receding, leading him away from the lamp, the stairs, and the city above. Hello? He entered a small cave. Another sound, a muffled laugh, came from his left. An unpleasant tingle ran up the back of Gregor's neck. Suddenly, he knew he had made a terrible mistake. He spun around, preparing to sprint for the door. Three rats emerged from the shadows, blocking his way. Gregor didn't recognize a one of them.